uh, which I pinched from a, a book by uh, the, the master of one of the Oxford colleges, uh, uh, who uh, that's his biography. And, um, I'm, I'm an optimist as well, so I rather like the, the uh, battle experience as an optimist because I'm optimistic about formal methods. Uh, I think they're going to keep going. Everyone's first of all, uh, you know, they're going to die out, but so they haven't died out uh, and they're continuing. So, back then, I've got a few silly so, slides. So, uh, although this one isn't so silly because in the early days of the uh, Airbus going up, uh, they really did uh, reboot the software just before they took off uh, because they knew if they did that, they were less likely to have problems in the air. So, that's one of the issues with software. We know that they can go wrong and uh, we want to find ways of uh, it not going wrong. Full methods is just one of those uh, ways. Uh, Yes, now, now in fact, all methods have been applied in the yeah, that's another uh, aircraft. So it's particularly, obviously, useful in uh, safety and security systems, especially, I guess, in aircraft, because, you know, there, a lot of systems, the best thing is just to, just to shut down and stop at aircraft. That isn't the best thing to do. It's, more, uh, if you're, it's more a dynamic system. <coughs> uh, I've actually had a go, go on an aircraft, which is the, where it's a simulator. But, uh, uh, I mentioned one of the things I do is travel around, so uh, I've had to do quite a lot of accreditation visits with somebody else in the audience here. Uh, thank you very much for, for that. And, and one was uh, actually at the Emirates uh, Aviation College, which is the Emirates uh, uh, company that flying to uh, Dubai. Uh, and I guess when you go and do these accreditation visits, they, they just happen to have three simulators that they have for their practical sessions, which is quite a nice set of practicals compared to what I got when I was a student. So at least I was able to say, well, I need to go and test out the practical equipment to make sure it's all up from scratch. Uh, and uh, actually, it's surprisingly easy to actually do the flying, taking off and so on. The difficult bit is actually switching the thing on. It takes about 20 minutes. You know, it's not just turning the key. You know, power up <coughs> the engine separately to make sure everything's OK. But somebody just behind the person who took his camera and did all that for me. <laughs> and then he just said, right, you can take off now. All that runs around and uh, over the palm and by and so on and then back, back down again. <coughs> uh, so I mentioned one of the issues of uh, academia and industry not mixing too much. And I guess that's really if you some of theory and practice not mixing. So one of my things that I'm very keen on is to actually get theory and practice working together. Uh, and it's just a nice quote that all the formal methods people here would have seen, that some of the others may not have seen. Uh, it was left by Christopher Strange, who died rather young in Oxford, and then left this note in his desk uh, that Tony Hall found when he arrived at Oxford. And he uses it quite a lot. But certainly it's uh, something that Tony Hall and the rest of the group at Oxford have tried to uh, uh, promulgates that you need to get the two parts together. It's, it's not even the case in a lot of uh, computer science departments that the theory and practice people talk to each other. So it's not just industry and academia. <coughs> so as formal methods, uh, well, I've, I've been asking this in every talk, you know, where did the term formal methods come from? And nobody seems to know. I mean, we know where software engineering came from as a NATO event and so on. Uh, it's, it seems to come out of the mathematical world. I mean, I certainly have a book uh, with the type of formal methods in the early 60s about logic and so on, about mathematician. Uh, uh, how it actually got into computer science is uh, still, still an interesting. Uh, well, if anyone knows, I'd like, I'd like to know. Uh, it's, if formal methods, you, there are two parts you can do specification proofs. And uh, I put optionally there because actually a lot, lot of use in industry is more on the specification end, which is a lot of proof people are down on. But actually, it's, uh, you know, it's just as important a, a part uh, of using formal methods. Uh, and I'd say, well, I'm an engineer by training. And I would actually say, you know, software engineers are trying to say engineers have to do proofs. If you try to say that in any other engineering discipline, they'd look at you and think, you know. But yes, obviously theoreticians need to go and do that. Do the actual practical people need to do it. I'm coming here, I walk past the James Maxwell building in King's College, south of the river. He came up with Maxwell's equations 
that the now engineers all use Maxwell equations, and we assume he got it right. So he's a very clever person. <laughs> uh, we don't have to re uh, find or prove Maxwell's equations every time we need to use them. Uh, and I think for the future, you know, if we're looking to developing software engineering, we really need to try and do, do the foundational uh, proof work and so on to try and make a much more calculational approach uh, once we've done that. Uh, right, what, one thing I have organized for a long time on the web is formal methods information. So I've managed to be reasonably high up on the Google rankings when you type formal methods. Uh, and more recently, I've set it up as a wiki. So anyone here who wants to put anything about anything you're doing with formal methods or find out about it, you're very welcome to go to this, this wiki site. Uh, and the uh, notation I've used mostly through my career is the Z notation. I mean, there's lots of different notations, and I guess Z is getting a bit long in the tooth now. Most people, you know, if you're starting now, a lot of people are using B, event B, and so on. Uh, but I'll, I'll use Z as a case study, because actually the big project I'm going to talk about it was based on Z. So Z is still being used for real projects in industry. It hasn't disappeared. You may not hear about it. And that's, that's one of the issues, is that uh, in industry, you have to sign non-disclosure agreements and so on. But there's one other person in this room who I can't reveal who was on, on the project and so on. So you're not allowed to always talk about these things. Uh, but anyway, look, looking at Z notation as a, uh, I guess, how it's developed as a community. Uh, you know, if you want to get a, a formal method accepted, you've got to put quite a lot of effort into community building for that uh, method. Uh, so, and certainly a lot of effort was put in uh, on, on Z. I mean, more recently, I've actually looked at this in the context of sort of sociological view of how you develop a community. And when I was involved with it, I didn't realize that there were more, uh, more theoretical ways of looking at it. But anyway, you certainly need to develop things like courses. And there are people in this very room who still teach Z courses, so that there's a lot of Z courses, both in academia and industry. You certainly need textbooks, I mean, we have, in fact, we have a reasonable choice, but I think still, over the years, there's still only been, say, 15 dead textbooks. Uh, and if you go and sort of count the number of Java books, you know, it's a thousand <laughs> Java books. So, so that sort of puts you in the context of where the formal method is compared to, you know, mainstream programming languages and so on. Uh, nevertheless, you know, it's probably because they have more textbooks than I think probably any other. Uh, uh, formal method. Uh, tools are very important. That's the one area where perhaps said hasn't been so good. And I'll come back to that because you know an industrial project expect tools. And I'm going to talk about a project that you said and, and made the best of it, what tools there are, but certainly uh, tools could be improved. So newer uh, <coughs> like B and so on, uh, better tools. Uh, and that's where you might start if you're starting from scratch now. Uh, so the various, various web resources, discussion groups, uh, we have a Z user group. There is a Z standard. I mean, that's one thing. If you do a, a, a new notation, you're probably going to want to do a, an ISO standard. Uh, <laughs> has anyone, I, I always ask, has anyone, oh, somebody has been involved with standards. <laughs> uh, anyway, so it's a long process. And, uh, uh, certainly with Z, you know, a decade was spent and, and some problems were found in that decade, so it probably was worth it. <laughs> yes. The first thing found out is problems is in this very room. Uh, uh, so, you know, it's a, it's a lot of effort involved. And literally, you know, we had a Z, a specification of Z in the beginning of the 90s and by early 2001 there, uh, you know, we come up with a, a standard, so it took a long time. <coughs> but it is useful for tools and so on. Uh, so this is just, uh, some of you have probably seen this in the formal methods uh, people, but uh, this is just thinking about abstraction, because actually formal methods and formality is about abstraction. Uh, <coughs> what level are you going to describe a system at? So when you start to describe a system, you might literally have a back, back of an envelope to start writing things down. And you might go and talk to the customer and write some points of th things they want. Uh, and I'm just surmising in this uh, fictitious example that maybe you write 25 lines down talking to the customer 
find out what, what they want from the system. Uh, <coughs> probably informally. But, and then you, you go back to the company or whatever and you start thinking about what it really is they want. And if, if you're a Z person, you might try and write some little bits of Z specifying what you want. But you're probably going to flesh it out a lot more. Uh, come up with some sort of spec and probably start finding sort of inconsistencies in what those requirements were uh, and go back and uh, perhaps change those requirements. And you can see at this point, it's not too much complexity, it's very easy to change your mind. Uh, <coughs> then, of course, what, if you agree that yeah, we've got a spec, then you'll start trying to do a design where you're going to start saying how you're going to implement it with uh, data structures and exactly the, the way it's going to be implemented. Uh, yes, and I, I, mean, I put these orders of magnitude bigger each time because actually I, I think unless you have an order of magnitude more complexity in the next level, there's not much point in, in doing that. <clears throat> I have seen one formal methods paper where it has one, it had a spec and then it had a program or programs, uh, I think one and a half times as long as the spec mm. and the whole paper was written proving that one like the other, well, that, that's a particularly useful exercise. But if you're trying to connect things that are an order of magnitude uh, different in size, then that's a useful exercise. Uh, so eventually, of course, you're going to try and program this, and that's where I, I, I say that everyone has to use formal methods because a program is a formal uh, object. It's got a mathematical meaning. It just happens to be executable. It happens to be a lot bigger than what you need if you, if you just write a specification. Uh, so, of course, at each of these levels, you'll probably find problems and you'll have to go back. And you, and you hope you don't have to go back all the way to the top, because that means you have to go all the way around bigger and bigger loops. So, so the more you can be doing these loops higher up, the better. Uh, getting rid of errors. Obviously, errors are going to always seep down, but the more you can get rid of uh, as you do this, the better. Uh, and, of course, after that, it's all now we have compilers uh, fully automated. So, you know, you'll be on some of the million, millions of components once you're, uh, once you're running. <coughs> so, of course, we're, I'm interested in this talk in these upper levels, getting to the, the program code. Uh, so, just a couple of silly slides, which some, some of you may have seen, but certainly you can Several formal methods in the industry is a difficult. <laughs> I don't know if anyone's tried to try selling eels. But, uh, these are quite, quite old now, but it's quite a good uh, comparison. And this is one I always like to watch. You know, we do have an awful lot of different formal methods. Z is one of them. I've mentioned B. There's other theories like PVS there. Lot, there. There's lots of different ones. And if you're in industry and you look at these formal methods floating around, it's very difficult. You know, that's, this is the poor industry person. Here, you know, a bit miserable. You know, trying to work out which one to use is very difficult. Uh, and we don't have a solution, but I think it's something that formal methods people ought to be working on more to help uh, in deciding. Uh, and of course, the tools are very difficult to, to use. <laughs> the uh, they're getting better. So. Uh, but if you go into industry with tools and you show them some academic tool, that's not going to be of much interest to them. You've got to have something really robust uh, that uh, looks impressive. You know, you've got a good user interface and so on. Uh, so over the years, there have been uh, various books, some, some by me, some by others, and we have a bit of race through these. But this is sort of you know, a situation 15 years ago or something. Uh, Various examples of formal methods being used uh, in later some more time. So there are all these different examples floating around, which we're trying to capture some of these uh, in, in books to say you know, formal methods are being used. Uh, and I guess, you know, probably, although everyone maybe slates Microsoft somewhat, they're probably one of the bigger users of formal methods now because they've you know, had problems with software over the years. Uh, and they realize they need to improve, and they, they are doing a lot of formal methods stuff around the back, perhaps not being called formal methods, but so it certainly is a formal approach. Uh, and there are some recent books, that I just thought I'd do a quick check to see what's around, so you know, people are still doing uh, examples of formal methods. So that's a little background, slightly historical intro. Now we're going to get on to the, the main part, which is uh, 
an air traffic control project that I've mentioned that I was working on that uh, you said uh, to, to do quite a large uh, project. It's about 150 people, so, so I guess not mega size, but a reasonable size. Uh, <coughs> and the, the customers, uh, NATS, they, they have a lot of flights, uh, a lot of people involved, you know, they want to keep them all safe and so on. Uh, they, you know, that's over you know, three times as many people in the country passing through. Uh, <coughs> it's all, there are various uh, air traffic control centers, uh, and the one this particular project was uh, uh, working towards was uh, Swanick. Uh, so even around Europe, I'll show you later, there's a lot of different uh, air traffic controls, and they're all, they're all centers. Uh, there are obviously lots of airports, and they all have their own separate air traffic control for local uh, control. So, so this project was to do air traffic control uh, in England and, and Wales, essentially. So this is the uh, uh, NATS uh, centre in Swanwick. You can see, it. I guess it looks like a sort of ordinary building, but it's pretty well defended because you know you don't want uh, your air traffic control going wrong. Uh, so it's got uh, lots of different electricity supplies coming in. It's uh, you know terrorists come in. This thing you know it's pretty well built to stop that. The whole thing burns. It can keep going for quite a while, uh, and so on. There's a room full of batteries. If all the electricity goes, they never have to use those. Uh, <coughs> but at the inside, I guess you can see it's just a lot of, lot of screens. Um, and we're looking at a. There's a local screen, and actually, until this project, they were still using you know, maybe a to here, you know, real flight strips, uh, and that that's one flight strip. So this is just a test to see if there are any uh, real air traffic controllers here, bar, bar anyone on the project. Which flight strip? This this is. I can tell you, it's going to be. It's got Heathrow at the bottom there. Okay, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes. It is JFK. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So uh, I guess the, uh, the the clue is probably conk. You may have heard of an aircraft called conk. And speed for that is exactly. So, so this is actually the last flight, which which I was oh. quite interested in because it used to fly over our house oh. twice a day, and yeah. the beams used to shake. Yeah. Now it's a bit quieter. So they, they 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 did actually give me a genuine quotes uh, flight strip for the last flight of conk, but an awful lot of printed for the last. <laughs> Which bit said Heathrow? Uh, yes, Echo Golf Lima Lima, the bottom line. Oh, obviously. They're different codes to the ones you use for your baggage. That's yeah, what's confusing me. Yeah, 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 certainly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's not you. Anyway, so, so <coughs> air traffic control in Europe. So, yes, you, you may wonder what's going on here, but the first time I gave this talk was in New Zealand. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> slightly differently to us. So, but I kept it in. But for you, I'll tell you how to do it. So that you might make a bit more sense for the European airspace there. And you can see it's pretty com complicated. Well, you can see over here, this is, this is the air traffic control we were working on for London. Uh, you can see Scotland above, Sh Sh Shannon, that's Ireland. So hopefully you can start working out the list of Portugal, etc. Uh, but you can see it's quite, quite a lot of different uh, Sectors, if you like, and then as you fly around Europe, you'll be passed as you go over any one of these boundaries, you'll be passed from one to another, moving from feet to meters as you travel. Mm -hmm. um, that's one thing we have to spend a lot of time on with humans because that's quite, quite an, an issue. Uh, <coughs> so, you can see this project is actually doing quite a small task for even the European airspace. Obviously, they probably hope that they'll be able to. Interest other people to use the same same uh, software. So, what is the detailed picture? This one. Uh, well, this is uh, that's just London. I mean, this is off Wikipedia, so they just had this incident. Uh, Paris. But Paris, they're not Florida. the same areas, are uh, they? Well, it's this it's this area here. So oh, I see. It's a blow up of that. So, so this is the bit. There's Man Manchester, obviously. It's blown it up, so you can see a little bit of airport uh, yeah, traffic control there. Yeah. So, uh, well, you know, I guess NATs have a sort of lowish profile. Uh, but you see it every so often. If you go around Heathrow, I saw a sign, advertising sign here where they've got uh, NATs, so it does sort of appear. 
Uh, and you saw how complicated that was, and how you might think now we have the European Union, so it will be <laughs> unified. Uh, well, they are talking about it. So there is this project called TESA that started in 2004. It's due to finish in 2020. So where they might be, what well, the aim is to try and unify the European skies. Well, we can see it's a very long term project, and they're uh, only about halfway through it. So <coughs> I don't know how, what's going to happen at the end of that. So I mentioned that this is going to talk about some industrial uh, <coughs> work. Um, when you work in industry, you have to sign a non-disclosure agreement, so you have to get things agreed. So the, the slides in the middle here are actually slides that have been agreed uh, by the customer, originally prepared by Neil White, who was one of the uh, engineers on, on the project. Uh, so just uh, a quick overview of uh, the project is called IFAX. Maybe you can never remember what IFAX stands for. Uh, one thing you, you find in industry is that when you arrive, there's so many different acronyms flying around, and everyone knows what the acronym is, but nobody actually knows what the acronym stands for. So it's just an interesting observation that I noticed when. Uh, <coughs> uh, so, anyway, it tells you what IFAX is in a slide or two later. Uh, the, main, the main part of the talk is uh, the talk about Z, so there's a lot of specification that written on this uh, project. It was implemented in Spark, I'll talk just a little bit about that. Uh, and I guess the most interesting part, I think, is actually the fact that they were using the Z to do the, the testing, so that was the main idea of having the Z, <coughs> not to do groups, but actually have something you can test against. And normally when you do testing, when you write a program, we don't really know what the program is meant to do, so you put the figure in the air and do a few, a few tests you think are, are good. Whereas here, the very formal, I guess in the, in the non-formal <laughs> meaning, but a, a rigorous approach to actually deciding what tests you need to do it by looking at the formal specification. Uh, and there was a little use of mathematics as well, so I'll come on to it. Uh, so anyway, NAS is well, it's, it's really the, the air traffic control and services provider. Uh, this, this is what uh, the airspace looks like within that uh, the, uh, uh, European map we saw. So actually, you know, it isn't just one big area that you can fly around. Uh, basically, you have sort of almost like motorways, tubes that you're allowed to fly through in the air. And they being allowed basically the whole of airspace is actually military airspace to start with. And they generously allow uh, civilian aircraft to fly you know, in various parts if you have to follow the rules. And they can change at any time if there's an emergency and you can all be switched back to being military airspace. The Queen flies anywhere, all round her becomes military airspace automatically, you know, you can go there, for So things can change. Uh, but that's what it simply looks like. Obviously, things are complicated around here, and even this is all under the London control. But once you're going out on one of these sort of highways, if you like, then that's part of this uh, air traffic control system. Uh, and, and you see, actually, learning all the different parts of this, if you're an air traffic controller, you, you get to learn different. This, even these are all divided up into sectors, and you get to learn that particular sector and its geometry, you know, and you know you know how to get planes in and out of that particular part. And what happens if you need to fly outside of those corridors? Well I recommend not not <laughs> no, <but> I mean, <laughs> for example, there's a perfectly good airport at Newquay down in Cornwall. Well this is all at a certain level, so if you lay down things are a bit different. different. So we're we're dealing with high up to twenty two thousand feet up. Right. So okay. yes, low down you can get away with a lot more things than you can. Well, now you don't even need to tell anybody if you're in the uncontrolled airspace, yeah, yeah. you just fly an aeroplane. Okay. Yeah. Where the yellow crosses the uh, green and blue, yeah. I assume that's at different heights. Is that well, there, there's, some, there's some traffic lights in there. <laughs> 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 is, it, is it like a flyer? I'm not absolutely sure. I mean, you, yes, I mean, you, you obviously do keep things separate. Mm -hmm. Whether well, well, they, you know. Sometimes there's more traffic one way and then you let the traffic the other way. I'm not absolutely sure because you know that wasn't not I'm not actually an air traffic controller. Okay. I think maybe some of the colours are I think they've got yeah. names which are those colours in yeah. some cases. Yeah, yeah. And the one. Right, okay. Well it does say console control 
but it's very some of these are actually as people as local control centers as well. <coughs> so this is what a air traffic control team look like. Actually, this is pre-installation of the new stuff. And I'll explain uh, the differences. So, so there's three people on this team. There's a planner. And a, a, you can think of uh, air traffic a bit like the internet. So you've got all these uh, uh, planes, planes flying around. And, and of course, on the internet, you get given packets. And you're trying to get rid of them as quickly as possible to somebody else. That's, that's how the internet works, essentially. So the planner takes some of these these planes in, uh, and then also deals with getting rid of them again onto the next person. Uh, and you know, you now up to about six or seven planes uh, being dealt with by this team. So you have to be very good at sort of video game three D, uh, being able to understand where six different things are flying around if they're going to hit each other, etc. Uh, so that, that's what the tactical control will do. <coughs> Once you've been given a plane to deal with. You know, we've got to get it out again. How are we going to get it out? What route are we going to ask them to do? That's what the controller does. And well, in the other system, you have a, a system doing flight strips. So, of course, I've told you flight strips is one thing to be made for electronic. So, I guess this is where unions get involved. You know, what's this person going to do? So, obviously, there's all that side of uh, things to deal with. But uh, uh, actually, the the air traffic controllers really like the system because it gives them a lot of extra information, as well as getting rid of the flight strips. It gives, uh, and as well as, in addition to the sort of standard uh, information they previously got, there's a lot of other information that they're now given that helps them make decisions. <coughs> so, okay, it's interim future air area control tool support. So, uh, presumably at some point, interim will, will disappear. <coughs> Uh, so, as I said, it's, it's replacing these flight strips is, is one thing, which is a relatively small thing to do. Uh, but the more interesting part is the coming up with these traje trajectory tools. And they're various different ones. Uh, I'm going to show you one example of this bit of paper. Uh, but they basically, previously, you know, they literally had to hold everything in their head and look at this 2D map of uh, what's going on in 3D. Uh, whereas these trajectory tools give them extra information and lets them look ahead uh, more. I mean, I think you could only look ahead about five minutes previously, and this lets you look ahead 15, 20 minutes. Uh, so it gives you, you know, a lot, lot more control about, I guess, that's you know, these planes, something might be happening, you better do something about it. Uh, so it's not an air traffic control system, and this system doesn't tell the planes what to do. This is just something to aid the uh, air traffic controllers, they look at it and make the decisions and then tell the pilots. Uh, I mean, of course, this whole thing could be totally automated and you can just send messages to planes saying, do this, get any pilots. But most of you probably wouldn't want to fly on planes like that, so it's not acceptable. Really. <coughs> so this is one, one example of one of these tools. Uh, so this is a separation <coughs> monitor, and I suppose you can see you've got time to interaction here. Between naught and 15 minutes. So, this is looking at pairs of planes and what might happen to them in the future. Uh, so, <coughs> it's uh, basically and up here we've got separation. So, this line's uh, five nautical miles, and that's the separation you normally want to keep between planes. So, if you want to think of this as a video game, essentially you're trying to keep all the planes above that five. Uh, Five, five. So you've got two here in bed, obviously you need to do something about it. If it gets down to zero, zero, well, hopefully you can see that's a disaster situation because you've got two planes in the same place uh, now and maybe they're crashing. So, so obviously looking at this, you know, this is the nearest to zero. We want to do something about this because they're quite going to be, if we don't do anything, they're going to be within two miles of each other. That's something we want to avoid. So, you know, the air traffic control is seeing this. Will, First, of this decide what, what we're going to do to get that back up into this safe area. I mean, this one is only just in five, so it's not it's mm -hmm. further away, so we don't need to worry quite so much. Is so, this horizontal separation or, uh, that, or what? Well, you see, you, yes, again, again I'm. Uh, you are simplifying yes, it. Yeah, I'm simplifying it, yes. Yeah. Well, obviously, you've got different levels, you have planes at different heights and so on, so yes. 
<coughs> but I think hopefully it gives a play, an idea of the sort of thing things they've got, which previously, you know, matter of fact, you can't calculate that sort of map in your head. You know, you're, you're, you're probably, you might just about be able to think of something very close to here, but anything further out. So that, that means they can actually start dealing with things much earlier on, which means actually you can take avoiding action without, without changing the planes too much and save fuel. So one of the big things about this is it actually saves money. So you need less fuel because you have less you know, panic situations because you, you've done things a lot, lot earlier on. <coughs> so looking at the Z part, you said people can put their, their binoculars on that. <laughs> Uh, so the, the IFAC spec was, uh, the functional spec was done in, in Z, so and there's thousands of pages of Z, so it's a pretty big Z, uh, Z spec. I mean, obviously there's some structure to that, it's not, but actually the, the biggest part of the system was, you know, over a thousand pages, uh, so that's a significant size Z, Z spec. Uh, some of the algorithms were specified with maths, so you know, like where you just want to do differential equations and so on, to cut some of those calculations of paths and planes and so on. It doesn't make sense to use that, you just use normal maths uh, for that part of it. Uh, for the human machine interface, typically you're sort of, you know, if you're once in one state, you do something, you want to go to another state, well, they were just specified as tables, which is fairly, I mean, they literally, when they're implemented, they go into arrays. And, in A, that's quite fairly that's simple. Uh, and of course, there's a lot of uh, English. So actually, the Z spec, just like we always recommend the Z, you know, at least half of it was English in amongst that, that thousand or whatever pages. Uh, so it's quite, you know, there are obviously guidelines to follow, and they certainly follow the normal Z guidelines, having a good amount of English, which was actually liked by, by men, you know, the customer, some of the customers. Could read the Z, but some couldn't. So the idea was you could actually read this document, and even if you couldn't understand the Z, you could still read the English part. So, yes, this is where you can get. So, that's a typical bit of Z. That's probably one of the large, I mean, maybe most of the schemes are probably a bit smaller than that. Some are larger. I mean, no, no, no scheme was more than a page. <coughs> Not really wanted to say a portion of a page maximum to look for the guideline. But anyway, you can see a bit of English there describing. Things uh, in standard Z style, various uh, predicates and so on down there. <coughs> so, uh, and one big issue in industries is, is training. So, uh, and, th and they realise actually that reading Z is a lot easier than writing Z. It's a bit like reading a novel and writing a novel. Hopefully, most of you can read one because you might think twice about writing one. Uh, so most of the people on this project only needed to be able to read Z, because actually the spec team was relatively small to write Z. But there were a lot of testers and programmers and so on who needed to look at the spec, understand it, and do whatever they needed to do. Uh, so you can see that they have a three-day course. Uh, uh, they say, towards the after a week, probably optimistic. But, but then these these are good software engineers. So certainly the people, you know, they. they they are contractors as well as uh, <coughs> their own staff, and uh, uh, you know the people doing the Z part were good, good software engineers. So they trained up 75 people to read Z. Fortunately, I was one of the people who already used Z, so I had to do some of the training as a result. Uh, but interestingly, they also, uh, you know, some of the air traffic con control people, the main experts, people, the customer people from the customers. Team and so on. They all learn Z. Well, some of them, some of them also learn Z. So, because uh, NAFS was very much involved with the project as well as the cultural uh, uh, practice. <coughs> so there, there is a Z writer, of course. Well, the, these two courses are things that Praxis, or upfront Praxis now, do anyway. You know, they provide, you can kind of have a Z course there. So they're using it on the project to train people for this project. Most of the people. Already at Praxis, you know, lots of them know Z anyway, and we used them for a long time. Uh, so, they have another three day course which you might do in addition, uh, and they say three months. Well, I, I, as, a, as an academic, I might double these numbers and say six months. But, you know, certainly you're, you're doing 
and after a few months you're, you're doing it. But you can see, three months is an awfully long time in industry to get up to. So, you know, most, most industries are happy if you can do something after a week, but if you say it's going to take three months, that, that's one of the problems with form methods. They say, well, you know, it's too long, we haven't got time to do that. Uh, I mean, in this case, they're able to do it because the company of Prax is one of the leading form methods companies already. You know, they've got people trained up, so they don't have that three months problem. Because if you're starting from scratch, that's a really, really big issue. Excuse me, can you tell me what you mean by uh, fluency in Z? In other words, how much of well, Z are we well, that, that's about? why I say three months, I'd say six months. So, yes, it depends what you mean by fluency. So, you know, that's, I don't think there's an absolute definition of fluency. Sure, but right. if it's just sets and partial functions, for example, oh. then. Oops. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, they, uh, well, they, they learned a reasonable amount of yeah. no, uh, Yes, maybe they didn't learn you know, bags or something. <laughs> but, uh, but no, no, this is learning Z, so yes, not, not a restrictive <coughs> form of Z. Uh, I think the main, you know, if you use anything like Z, it's, it's like writing English. You know, the first time you write an essay, you think you look back at it a few months or two later, and that's rubbish because you, know, you improve. Well, it's just the same when you learn Z. The first things you write on wonderful, but then you get better at it. Uh, <clears throat> so it's no, no worse than learning a natural language, you know, perhaps, perhaps better. Well, I was going to compare it with learning a, some other programming language. Okay, yeah, yes. Um, well, yes, but you don't simple. become fluent in C++ in yes. three months, surely. Okay. Well, that's why I say six, six months. <laughs> Yeah. Depends what you mean. I don't know. I mean, you know, typically when you they, read the job they, they, ad first. They mean we can, we, can get, we can charge a customer for this person. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's, that's, that's an industry definition of fluent. But I mean, when you, when you look at job adverts, <coughs> you know, two years experience in yes. C programming or something would be considered a, yes. a sort of well, you know, that's you might look at. Remember, I would say these are the top, top, you know, might be top 10% yeah. software engineers. So these are good engineers. Yeah. I mean, one, one problem with software, I always think, is that, you know, the, the good people are ten times as good as the bad person, and the good person only costs twice as much as the bad person, so actually you're much better off paying people twice the salary, getting a really good person who's going to do you know, a really good job, and probably ten times more productive than that, you know, half, half price person. That, that's one of the problems with software metrics and so on, that you get things like that. It's not like putting rivets into a, a ship, where you can just count the number of rivets and say it's going to take so long because uh, you know the, the, the people do, it's so people dependent on, on the project and, and, and our practice just make sure they get good people in projects like this. Yep. Uh, so yes, you'll be interested to know all the Z was written in Microsoft Word because uh, I mean although any real Z person would of course use LaTeX, which I, I guess any real industry person would normally use. Uh, so yes, in real industry, you have to use what real industry uses, which is Word. So yes, all these thousands of pages were in Word. You might be amazed to hear, but it still worked. I mean, it's like, maybe slightly clunky, but it wasn't a huge issue. I guess one one good thing was that uh, Anthony Hall has actually written a very nice tool to go with Word for type checking, which is, any of you have to write said in Word, and it's a really good. So uh, basically, it converts the word back into LaTeX, does the type checking rules standard. But, but then, very cleverly, then works back again and works out right exactly where in the uh, Word document that LaTeX line was. So it does actually point you know, to where the errors were. So it's, it's one of the nicer tools around for that. And that's a very, very important part of this project. Because even just type checking that, that does an awful lot of checking in something that's a thousand pages long. You can find an awful lot of problems. Uh, so these are advantages and disadvantages are written by a real uh, industry person rather than me. So as I said, this is by one of the, the real engineers. So, so they, they certainly like the fact that you can put the English and the Z together in documents and that works very well. Because also with these other formal methods, you have sort of separate bits, mathematics and English, and you can you know, try to relate the two can be difficult. Uh, so yes, the, the, the errors, getting the errors back in the right place, that was very important part of that tool we just mentioned. There were also uh, another part of the tool was just doing cross-referencing of all the Z 
names, all those scheme, schema boxes and names. You know, you've got thousands of schemas. You see one reference somewhere, where, where is it? So literally, you can you know, press the thing and it will go to the right place in the document and time, whichever it is. And as well as producing a, a, a normal index so that you can look at on paper as well. <coughs> so yes, okay, this advantage is yes, the large doc, word documents are a pain, but, uh, but still, it's still possible. Uh, so it can be, you know, when you have a thousand page document, as I mentioned, it can be a bit slow, but not unbearably slow. So it might take a few minutes to uh, do your type checking, but it's not sort of hours. So it's sort of a cup of coffee or lunch, a good lunch. Not a good lunch. Yeah. <laughs> a French lunch. Yeah. Uh, another issue is bra branches, which are, so we're, on a real project like this, you know, you've got different people working on different versions of, of the uh, uh, software, the spec, and so on. So the spec people are coming up with some new things, and they've got different. Uh, maybe some bits are going to be included, and other bits not. At different stages, uh, and then eventually, of course, when well, you've got the programmers and the testers working on slightly different versions, uh, but eventually you want it all to come back together again. Uh, so that actual merging part can be well. They did have you know, things in Word that helps you do it, but it's still still not perfect. Uh, I guess one issue they had also, obviously there's that open office versus Microsoft Office, and they were actually interested in using both, because sometimes one was better than the other, so uh, it's just a, a practical issue. So I mentioned state, state machines, so actually the spec for this, although you could write this in Z or anything else, it just really wasn't worth it because essentially you know, if you're in one state and these states might be fed schemas and you're going to move to another state, another fed schema, whatever. You know, so when you press a button, something's going to happen. Uh, so literally you, know, you can use a, a, a matrix or a thing like this to actually say this is what's going to happen. And that just maps straight onto an, an array in Canada, for instance. So training for that, well, hopefully even you can sort of see. My, I've just given you the training, okay? So, so you're now all experts in that. Uh, so there are, and there weren't even any tools. You could imagine having somebody that automatically took one of those and made the made a uh, array for you. So the, the Spark, well, the Spark Ada, which I was less involved with, I was involved from the, the Z team. Uh, the Spark ADA, if you don't know, it's just it's an annotated subset of ADA, which is the safe bit of ADA. So ADA with all the difficult bits <laughs> taken out, the bits that have semantic problems. Uh, <clears throat> so and then that means it does have things like uh, various uh, tools for doing proofs and so on, uh, which weren't used on this project. So I'm not going to concentrate on that. So actually, although Spark ADA was used on this project, because the Practice know it well, you know, and they've got people trained up to program in it. Uh, they didn't use any of the, uh, the proof tools uh, with it. So it's just done by programmers looking at the Z spec, they've all been trained to read Z, and then programming. And actually, you know, if a programmer knows what they're meant to do, they're pretty good at doing that. Normally, the problem in the, in the industry is the programmers given a bit of English and a few diagrams and probably go off and prove them something. I think that's right. But <laughs> well, it can, can be like that anyway. But here they did actually have a, you know, a formal definition of what was needed and provided they could read that formal definition. Actually that transition uh, is, you know, obviously can introduce errors, but a lot and lots of errors were introduced. Uh, so you probably can't see this much, but uh, I mean, you can add things like assertions to say this is what we want for this stage. And so in your annotated, these are the red bits of <coughs> annotations. Uh, <coughs> so, and on smaller projects where it's more feasible, you know, they do do proofs of practice. But this, as I said, it's a big project. And it's just not feasible on this, not cost effective. Uh, the, the assertion there, is it just a comment or is it actually there? Uh, well, no, it, well, it's it's a, basically, it's, it's meant to be a comment so that a normal ADA compiler doesn't know that <coughs> assertions will ignore it as a comment. But there's a tool that reads Yes, there's a tool that will look for this hash, yeah, yeah, comment hash, yeah, yeah. and then use those effects. So it's a slight trick. Yeah. Right? Just, just means it's all backwards compatible with other 
non mm. <coughs> So, well, slightly fewer people were trained to do Spark, because only people doing the implementation needed to know about Spark. But, and I was, as I said, I wasn't on the implementation, so I've never been on a Spark training course, obviously. It looks a little bit. Uh, so, and most of the people doing this were contractors. I mean, actually, this project was bigger than the company, you know, so uh, there were a lot of contractors involved, but also a lot of uh, people from the company. Uh, so, you know, people might have, so they have quite diverse programming background, because I guess if you get a contractor, a lot of them won't have done Tago, they might have just done you know, Java, as I mentioned, whatever it is. Uh, I mean, to an academic, it's all the same. It's all just imperative programming, just with a slightly <laughs> different syntax. <laughs> if you're a good software engineer, you know, if you've learned one, it's just a slightly different dialect. So, <clears throat> uh, so the coders had to be Z readers because they that was spec. That's what they were meant to be coding. So they've all been on the Z reading course. Uh, and they, well, they said that they, you, you were saying it takes a while to learn to code. They're saying that. Learn quickly, but these would be people who would already be very good programmers and would be learning Spark Ada as, as just another syntax. But uh, if you want to do proofs, but well, they say two months, I said I would double the list for four months perhaps, but, but they weren't doing that anyway. Uh, so there is a tool set which I'm not going to really talk about because it wasn't used on the project. Uh, but perhaps the most interesting part of the project, I think, was you know, using formal methods. And the, the, the real use of that uh, set spec, as well as doing the coding, was actually to do the testing. So the, the test team was even bigger than the programming. It was the biggest team in the whole lot. Uh, spec team was quite small comparatively. So the, the, the testing team were busy producing a lot of documents like this, which again, you can't read. Right, because essentially looking at the Z spec, partitioning it up, I'm going to explain the standard ways of partitioning. So you know, if you have to do this or do that, then you want to test this or that. So those sort of standards uh, that were produced for the project to say how you should do this partitioning. Some of it was you have know, to use engineering judgment, there's quite a lot of uh, standard rules to follow. <coughs> and so you come up with various test conditions. So these are sort of Z, Z style uh, predicates here. Saying what we're going to test, uh, and then you know you might end up with things being true or, or false. So you have different sorts of dots for depending on what you're expecting uh, to happen for that case, or nothing. If you, you know, it's an arbitrary. But how are these produced from the Z? So, uh, manually. So manually. Yes, by, by reading the Z. A huge team, team of people reading the Z and producing this document. There's no tool at all. <clears throat> that seems strange. Uh, well, it'd be nice. I suppose it'd be nice to have a sort of first pass that took Z and did some partitioning, but there is no such Z tool as far as I know, unless anyone has produced one. But yeah, it's certainly very useful Z tool. You're, to you're yeah. presumably arguing that it's feasible to do that. Uh, well, not, it's not, you're not going to be able to do it all. You're still always going to need an engineer to do the difficult bits, but certainly you do a first pass. Uh, and, and say, okay, I've done this, you know, all the sort of relatively easy parts. You, you need, you know, it's going to be heuristics. So there's always going to be another heuristic you could add to say, you could do this automatically here. Uh, like, like proofs, you can automate all the proofs, but there's always going to be a little bit you can't do. But I seem to remember a long, long time ago now that there was a long discussion about the fact that it wasn't possible to test every path in a program because no, the combinatorial no, so explosion was just too big. Equivalence class to say, say, right, if somebody's here, we can on one test to do this, and you're going to assume that you know, that means that yeah. that part of it is being tested. So that thinking was all in it. Yeah, yeah. yes, yes. Yeah, I see. Uh, so, well, there's just one example of where that. I mean, if you, if you did just take the, the brute force program approach to doing this, then, well, he says this would end up with you know, a thousand things you might want to go through and test, which uh, they're not going to really want to. To do it in reality, but if you have a good engineer working on it, working out orders to do things in what makes sense, what doesn't make sense, then you can get it down to quite a reasonable uh, size of uh, test scripts. So obviously, a lot of testing you sort of do, you know, you do this test, then you work out, boy, can we do this test immediately? Because a lot of most tests you're trying to get into some state, do something, and find check the state after that. Correct. Well, 
both of those states, you can actually join them together and do it. And, uh, so, you know, a good engineer, and that's what you'll, you'll be thinking about. <clears throat> so, yes, yeah, so there's, there's lots of initiative in that part of it with needing good engineer judgment. But surely that could be automated. Because so, what you're describing conceptually is uh, so potentially to, yeah, yeah. to stick well, together two yes, states diagrams. Yes, so there is no tool at the moment. Okay. So, uh, and I'd still say there's going to be cases where you need an engineer. But yes, I agree. But so I'm, I'm throwing out some ideas. To <laughs> right. some challenges. These would actually be much more useful tools than lots of the tools formal methods people are doing at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, because most formal methods people are doing all these esoteric proof things. Yeah. But it's just something that actually did some of this you know, initial partitioning would be a really useful tool in industry. But I guess it's a chicken and egg thing that you know, there's enough demand, mm -hmm. etc. You know, like uh, you know, if you go to your bank manager and ask for £100,000 to develop one of these tools, you might have trouble convincing them of the market, etc. <coughs> so, uh, this, this bit I'm going to talk about now is the, the reference models for the, the mathematics. So all the, the algorithms, which is the bit they really want to protect. Unfortunately, I know nothing about it. So I can't tell you what the algorithms are anyway, which is a good thing. Uh, but, but they're specified in mathematics, you know, differential equations and so on. Uh, so, and, but they need to be tested, just like the Z things needed to be tested. So these were tested mainly by doing it with re reference implementations using Mathematica, because Mathematica you can just write the mathematics down very directly in the Mathematica tool, and then you can run that Mathematica tool in parallel with your program your code. and see. Uh, it's going to be uh, real numbers, so you're going to have to allow a bit of latitude, so you have to decide what, you know, it's not going to be an exact match, so you decide what, what, what's the maximum sort of area you will allow. <coughs> so that, that's engineering judgment. Uh, but that's how that part of this particular uh, uh, testing was done. So the Mathematica team was relatively small, there were only five people trained in Mathematica. Uh, interestingly, the reference model had, you know, if anything, there were as many problems in the actual reference model as the actual code did, which you might not have predicted. So, of course, when you get a mismatch, even with the Z, Dead, dead and program mismatch. But it might be the program that's wrong, or it might be the Z that's wrong. To find out, it might be that both are wrong, but normally it's fine. But, but uh, you know, even in the Z, uh, and actually often, for instance, in the Z, the programmer might do something sensible and say they didn't really mean that, because that's just what we should do, and then correct the Z. <laughs> Which might only just be something like brackets in the wrong place, you know, on precedence or something. Uh, so anyway, it's a very small number, and you can't really draw too many conclusions. Uh, so anyway, the contention is you know, formal methods are being used all throughout the life cycle field, uh, from spec through the coding through to testing, and even at the maintenance stage, which is you know, obviously they're in the maintenance phase now. You know, the Z spec is being maintained, so if there's a change, uh, then you've got to make sure keeping with the step. That's the idea here, that they are kept in step. Uh, so training engineers, as I said, is a barrier. I mean, it's a barrier one-off. So I mean, once you're over that barrier, you can practice well over that barrier. So the fact that you know, there are a few companies that use its formal methods, even when the customer doesn't say you have to use formal methods, because they know, you know, they know how to do it, and it's they're going to produce a better, better result, and you can do things often quicker and you do the testing is going to be less problematic, uh, <coughs> etc. Uh, so it's to tools is is the big issue. I mean the Spark Examiner is quite a nice tool, but the Z tools as I've shown you aren't particularly wonderful. So um, if people have suggested tools it'd be nice to have please do go and have a try and they'd be great. Uh, so I'll just add a little how long have I got some nice point. You're fine for a, a bit, yeah. Okay, yes. so there's only a bit more, so this is just sort of, a, we're on the downhill. <laughs> so just, just a few extra little things. I mean, another interesting tool they did use was a tool called DAWs, uh, which is very helpful in tracing, because a project like this, you've got a huge uh, spec with all these different schemas and obviously and all these different tests. 
Well, when you write an academic paper, you know, it's very easy to check this and all this stuff and the other. But if you've got thousands of pages, it's very easy to miss things. And so you want some sort of tool that's going to help you say, well, if you've got this uh, uh, spe uh, spec or this schema, you know, has it actually been tested? So this, this tool actually helps to show, demonstrate, yes, at least everything has had a test associated with it. It may not be necessarily the right test, but you haven't just forgotten it. That's a very important part to not forget anything. <coughs> uh, and it's got some quite nice visualization, well, some visualization of connection of schemas and so on. I'm always interested to find some of the visualizations in the middle of it that say true or false with the virus going in the past. I'm sure you yes, can enjoy that. Uh, so they, they have been doing, I mean, there have been little, little <coughs> further developments on IFAX you know, even up until now, and there's obviously been the maintenance. Uh, but the, the main part of the project is basically over. But there have been other projects looking at, well, this IFAX only looked up to about you know, 15 minutes or so ahead. So it'd be nice to actually look much further hours ahead to actually start to do some planning. As I said, a lot of you know, fuel is a really big cost. Actually, do some planning to make sure we're going to fly all these aircraft in a sensible way, minimise the fuel costs. So another possible, uh, well, a forecasting tool we've been work, working on. I don't, again, I don't have to say what's on the web, but it's something that actually looks forward hours ahead, you know, and can do some planning over that sort of time scale and optimise the, the air traffic flows. <coughs> so just a little bit of uh, reflection. So this is a quote I like because it's the, the uh, first quote about email. <laughs> 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 yes. uh, actually, that, that's the reason why French can't use the word email. They have to use courier because uh, email actually means uh, enamel in French. So still talking about sending an enamel. <laughs> uh, but anyway, this says that you know, you can, if you do things in more depth, using things like marble, enamel, and all these difficult things, uh, then you actually get a better result. And I, I, I would contend that you know, formal methods may not be particularly easy, <laughs> but they're going to come up with a, a better result than using you know, just a bit of the plastic and whatever it is that makes people do. Uh, and this is just a, a little uh, joke at the end. You should always be a bit careful with people selling their stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen that. If you've seen that. Yes, <laughs> That's all the methods people have seen. This. Anyway, I was walking down <laughs> The streets, and I looked in the window of one of the shops, and it said "Preparation Z." And I thought, "Well, it's Z on Oxford Street." I'm very good. That's what it's all about. Anyway, so um, I went to buy this thing called Preparation Z. It must, must be good. Uh, but then, then I sort of started uh, reading the small print, so it had all these uh, things that uh, you had to worry about. We're going to use the Z stuff. So in particular, it said that this said was being sold as a novelty. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yes, you should always be a bit careful. <coughs> Obviously, if you start using things like formal methods, you you know you, you can't expect it to do everything for you. It's something that you're going to commit to, put some effort in, and you'll get some uh, uh, results in return if you put the effort in. Anyway, th thank you very much. <laughs> in academia, yeah. but I guess the problem with that animators is they're not very efficient and if you've got a thousand page set, yeah. then it gets a bit. I mean the one thing they did do a little bit was uh, there's an alloy tool which somebody made which is called Z like. So and, that, and it's very nice quick coding with alloy. Uh, so there was a little bit of sort of trying things out with alloy, you know, okay this this is a bit of Z route. We just want to check it all works as we'd expect. So if you code it up in the log, then you can very quickly see it was doing something sensible. You didn't try uh, Zans or Jazz? No, no, no. Well, is that, I mean, I don't know what the state of Zans is now. I mean, it's always it's been a bit of dodgy. Yeah. Sort of, um, well, it sort of stopped being developed. Yeah, it? well, exactly. You know, it's an academic yeah. to toy. It's a novelty item. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> so, I mean, it's a, very, I mean, it's a useful novelty item for teaching. I've used yeah, it for no, teaching. No, no. But in industry, I wouldn't say 
so that's one thing, as I said, in industry can be a bit confusing. It's like, well, there's all these different tools. Which are the ones I want? Um, and actually, to be honest, I think I would say don't use ZLS in, in industry because it, you know, it's, it is too much of a novelty. But it is good for teaching when you're first learning Z, trying things out with this. Do you know of any others apart from Z? No. Uh, no, well, you know, all the action now is in B and event B yeah. and so on. So, you know, although, you know, Z is still being used and you see for real things, there's not really much action. There was a C, ZT community tool, Z tools uh, project, and that sort of you know, it seems to sort of piece it out. Yeah. So it'd be nice if, uh, I mean, I think if you were investing in time for tools with Z, I would say the testing side is the side which would be really good to have some good tools for all the things we discussed earlier. It would be very nice to have something that does something for you for the testing. Uh, I've got three questions slash observations. Okay. So perhaps one of you. <laughs> perhaps <laughs> you okay. into the. Okay, what you. And then I'm going to come to. Oh, sure. Well, yeah. Yeah. Just, Carry on. Just, sure. just choose whichever is the most interesting question. Or, or you choose one and I'll oh. talk, to the, talk about the other ones afterwards. Uh, oh, yeah, okay. Or you yeah, can come back, do one now and we can come back if we run out of Sure, that's okay, that's fine. Um, first of all, you didn't say what data abstractions you're using, <coughs> which is very often the most interesting part of a formal model. Yeah. So, uh, looking at the uh, example I imagined that you were going to uh, then talk about how a region of space is represented as as a set of points, which is something that can't actually be implemented in a programming language, but it's uh, useful conceptually. And did you do that, or yeah, did well, you not personally? And I'm, as I said, I signed my non-disclosure agreement. Ah, so, so actually okay. going into details is something I can't. That. Okay. Is it fortunately I don't actually know any of that. <laughs> So, but, yes, yeah. ignorance is always a very useful thing in that non disclosure agreement. So, uh, okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, obviously, there's but, other there's things. There's a general point about yes, yes. data structures. Yes, yes. How would you respond to that? In what, in what so, well, so well, which data abstraction? Data abstractions, yes. yes. Sorry. Well, certainly, that's an important part of it. I mean, you, you, no, as right. we all know, an algorithm can be simple or Complex. Yes. Well, it's trivial or complex, you know, yeah. what structures yes. you. Well, it's an engineering judgment, I would say. Mm -hmm. I mean, remember, I came in uh, basically at the middle of the project, so I wasn't involved at yeah. in the early stage when all these sort of things were being decided. And they would have been decided by Nats talk, talking to you know, people at the practice, you know, trying things out, seeing what. Nats have got an awful lot of expertise already, you know. That, so, a big part of the project was you know, getting the expertise from maths people and using that to make knowledge, see what's sensible. Okay. So maybe most of the people on the project aren't air traffic people, including me. You know, I think. Uh, so it was very important to have the maths people who really knew about what the air traffic control was. Obviously, they might get bogged down with detailed things, and, and hopefully, formal methods people could be a bit more look at yes, in a more abstract way. And I would, the way I would imagine it would have happened is that they would have a discussion. Uh, practice people would come up with some abstraction, you know, go back and discuss it with the other you know, discussion of that, that level. Hopefully, at that nice high level, as I showed you in that thing, <laughs> so you're doing it all with 25, uh, well, you know, a few hundred lines of yeah. uh, level before you actually then, okay, we've got something that's worthwhile. And we'll go on. Uh, but yes, I wasn't involved with that, with that, at that stage. So do you want to do your other points? Uh, well, uh, yes. Uh, first, first of all, it occurs to me that there's no way of visualizing the structure of a Z specification that is uh, analogous to the way we can easily visualize the structure of an OO program using class diagrams. That's right. one observation. What at least you didn't say. Perhaps the reason I mentioned, but I mentioned there was one nine bullet point saying there was a visualization tool. Oh, right. So, okay. which I didn't yeah. uh, dwell on. Oh, I see. Uh, right. But yes, no, there, there were huge plots of basically schemas and how it was all connected together, mm -hmm. which I'm not, I mean, I would say it wasn't particularly useful, but it was interesting and perhaps sometimes yeah. useful, but it wasn't a big part of the project, so that's why I didn't. But, but no, there are visualization tools just 
do that. There's a line where I mentioned that how true or false is stuck in the middle, yeah, the middle of it with all these other schemes. Oh, <laughs> when see, when you saw the whole yeah. thing depending on false, you know. <laughs> 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 so, and, so okay, I think maybe but, the other question afterwards, because then I'll show you the others. Yeah, go ahead. Um, a very quick question first, and then we'll say something. Have they got been in the fight scripts now? Yeah, uh, yeah. Yes, but they can always go back to them. There's so always, got there's always a backup. Yeah. So if all the power goes, you know, they can get pulled yeah. and, and the telephone lines are still up. Yeah, yes, exactly. Um, you were slightly dismissive about the choice of language, and I, I always knew the yeah. Spark aid. I was surprised they didn't use the Spark. Um, is it, first of all, why didn't they go to regular aid if they weren't using the Spark? And, and have you got any feelings about which languages are more appropriate? And also, at the specification level, you've talked to us about Z, but you've mentioned others. Given a free choice, what would you go for? Well, the reason why Spark and, and, and Z were chosen here are because they're basically the house styles of practices. They've well, already got a lot of people trained up in, in Z, and so that meant that that issue of training up engineers in the company, anyway, was not an issue. Mm -hmm. That's um, normally the reason we give for not using Ada. <laughs> well, because in the case of practices, they the case of practices, the opposite. and they don't use, well, I suppose they would. If they were told by the customer you must use Ada and on Spark Ada, they might. They might. But, but you know they stick to Spark Ada because that's what they know. That's from, yeah. Okay. Uh, so and at the specification level, would you go well, for Z because well, there are more tools? Well, well, the, well <coughs> on this project, you know, it's a big project. So I think Z, well, despite the tools, you know, if you use something like B, B, I'm not convinced scales up quite so well. Okay. Well, they've got better tools. So actually, the scaling. <coughs> Z does scale, but you know, it's a thousands of pages, even without the decent tools. It's a, it's a real demonstration that you can use to okay. successfully scale up. Thank you. David, now from you. Yeah, I just wondered how, how close we are to um, eliminating the program and being able to compile specifications. Uh, no, and not close. No, 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 in fact, it's theoretically impossible. So, uh, can you elaborate that? Well, if, if you have to prove it's impossible, it's my job. <laughs> no, if you've got something that's not, not executable, transforming that into an executable, you know, you've got a lot of choices. Okay, you might you can do use heuristics to do some choice, but then it may be a very inefficient thing, you know. So you've got to put some then you know, there's always going to be another heuristic you need, which is the engineer coming in. So you can get a certain way doing it, but there's always going to be something you, you can't do or haven't thought of. Yeah. So, so another kind of, can I just put it on that? Because yeah. another way of putting that yes. is that you could, in principle, have a Z virtual machine that would run it. Well, you can't. Well, yes. you can't run it. well Z is non deterministic, so one, if you quotes run Z, when you've got a spec, and you know, a lot of different things could happen. So you, right. you've got to make a decision. Well, you can have a computer making a decision. We'll choose one of them. But it may not be the most sensible thing to choose for efficiency reasons or whatever it is. So there's always going to be some right. something. That okay. So this is a good good plug, good moment to plug the fact that we normally go to Champagne Charlie's Wine Bar, which is underneath Charing Cross Station after the, the event. And if you want to continue this discussion, <laughs> and Jonathan is, is free to come along. Well, well I'll... Yes, before too many champagnes. Yes. Exactly. Well, it's usually red wine. Oh, right. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. That okay. might be a good time. Sure. Sorry Sorry. For <laughs> right. So, anyway, your question. Yes. For the, the Z uninitiated, yes. um, are there any tools for checking conformance between the Z specification and, for example, Spark Ada in the same way that you have the news um, sort of suite of software model checking tools? Well, not. Maybe maybe it's something no, you would never want to do. No, I am an uninitiated no, person to Z. No, no, I mean obviously you know you've got these te tests, but you know the Z doesn't produce. I mean with Mathematica, for instance, you can run Mathematica is an executable specification language, so that is executable. So you actually get an answer out, and then you put them there, you know run your real program. It's much more efficient to get an answer and compare them. Well, you can't run the Z in the same sense because it's not executable. But can you check if the implemented Spark conforms 
perfectly with no, how it's been specified. No, well, in the word, no. Okay. Well, not, not, I mean, you know, you, as I said, you can do you can automate things to a certain extent, but there's always going to be something you can't do. So, I mean, for instance, with, again, with, with the B tool, a lot of that has proofs, and a lot of the proofs are automated, but there's always a certain percentage that has, you can't automate. And, and actually, one, one of the well, one of the important things when you're doing, using something like that tool is, uh, for instance, maybe you can automate 90% of the proofs and say you've got 10% of the work to do, you've got to do it by hand. Well, if, once you become better at B, you learn actually there are ways of writing, you can, you can automate 95% of it. So you halve your efforts <coughs> and you have to do 5% of the proofs. If you get even better, you can gradually ease it up. But there's always going to be that little bit with proofs, there's always something. You know, on a new system, there's some you know inaccuracies to do things. But there's always going to be something, uh, except for simple. I mean, you know, if you're doing some yeah. linked lists or something. You know, if you, uh, you know, the real system is always going to be new. Did, did you have a question? Oh, yeah, I was just wondering if uh, something towards the end. Where I was thinking, the schedule, the main airlines operate on a schedule that is sort of repeats on a weekly or daily basis. You hope so. <laughs> well, or so, it's, so, so it would so seem. Legendary, as they say. No, I just wondered yeah. if there's any history or learning of what were good strategies for. Uh, I think it's, yes, I mean, it's an interesting idea. And I don't know where they're coming from. I'm sure they must do recording. I think it's not, not an aspect I've been involved in. Yes, because you know, if you have a, do have a crash, you want to have the red, the black box for everyone. But you, you, you know, an air traffic controller might say it's Tuesday. There's this flight coming in. Last week I did this and it worked very well. Yes. You well, might imagine. I don't know how because I mean I think there's enough randomness when it comes to mm. that. You know, this flight be delayed by five minutes. Yeah. It's never going to be exactly the same each time. So I think you always. I mean, okay. If, you know, some things are going to happen the same. But I think you. I'm. I'm, I'm, I'm it's amazing. Slot elevation sort of does it for the airports, but not for the airways. Yes, well, you know, there's always something. The passenger hasn't gone on, they've left their luggage or something, you know, so the plane's today, it's the wrong order. Okay, if there were no passengers involved, then yes, we could all take off at the right time. It's But I think the weather as well. Yes, I mean, certainly that's part of the way. Yes, yes, yes. This part of this has got air. Putting the weather into it as well, so mm. I just, that's not just certainly not very. So the regularity is illusory. I think so. Well, I don't, I don't know exactly how much is regular, but mm. I think there's enough irregularities. Yeah. I mean, I'll be at the back of the language here. Is there such things like uh, good jet style and bad jet style? Yes. It's the same way as <laughs> it is in Portugal. Absolutely, yes. Are there any complications about it? Uh, well, there's some, I've written a paper. <laughs> 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 there are some, but they could be more. Because certainly, the, Z, the process of writing Z is interesting. Because actually, when most papers you read them and you have this Z spec that's appeared, you know, how did it get there? So, I think a very interesting part is you start with a blank sheet of paper, how you actually create something like a Z spec. I've written, you know, there are, I've written one paper on that. But, People have done things mm. on that, uh, and certainly on this project, for instance, there, there are guidelines for how to write the Z. Some, you know, some of which, well, a lot of it is standard stuff like you know, have some out of English and other things. But they had some things that were very uh, pertinent to very large specs. But as an academic, I think really have to think about before you do a large <laughs> spec. So just how you, how you're going to organise that spec so it's not totally pickledy pickledy. Well, if, if everyone agrees to conform to a certain way of doing things, then you know, with the hierarchical structure and so on, then then you can. Yes, it's a lot easier to navigate your way around. Uh, but yes, that that first three to six months, people are writing the bad set, <laughs> and you gradually learn you know, nicer ways of doing. It. And also, there's just different ways. Like you can write an English sentence in a different way. You can write Z in a different way. Some, some people love quantifiers. I, I'm not so keen on quantifiers. And you, can, you know, there's lots of Z operators that you can use instead of quantifiers, which looks a bit more like a functional programming or something. So a lot of magicians may prefer quantifiers. It's a, it's a stylistic thing. I mean, there were quite, we saw a few quantifiers there. There were quite a lot of quantifiers. In, there were. Yeah. 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 Just, just a, a quick question. 
Um, were formal methods used on all the software, or just the application layer? For example, I didn't notice there were some some graphics there. So were the graphics? Well, no. Yes, no, the, I think they no. The graphical side wasn't done formally. Yes, so it's the functional part. So right. most of the functional part was done formally. Yes. Yeah. Was it? Yes, the interface wasn't. Which was, I presume there was, there was no OS in the system. Uh, well, there is no OS, I probably yes. Sorry. <laughs> it's, it's not Windows. <laughs> yes, I yes, have. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so, that, that's, what, that's as much as I'll say. <laughs> right. Yes. Okay. All right, okay. last question. Uh, was it just plain said or was it object? No, it's plain said, yes. Yes. OK, I'm going to reserve my, give myself the last question, okay. which is, what was the customer reaction at the end of the project? Did the customer feel convinced that formal methods had actually helped to get well, a better well, product? Yes. Or well, I wasn't there at the end. I was at the end of the So it's a cop out. Give no, no, I, I was, yes, I can give a clue. <laughs> I'm just saying, was, no, but essentially, I think all, you know, the customer was very keen. They thought they, all these new projects are doing, so yeah. they're continuing and wanting to use. So, yes, no, not certainly realized it's a good thing to do. And they're follow on projects and they're continuing. So, you know, and, and that's people have learned Z, so they know Z now with a new project, you know, they, they can use those people, etc. So, yes, from that point of view, and that's so so it's, they, it's, they definitely have to say, go away, we never want to do that. Okay, now we, you know why I asked that, because when I was around with the Family of Kids product. Right. Oh, right. oh yes, okay. fair enough. Not that I was, no. um, didn't actually work on my yeah. kids, but I was well, that's very the well aware. Very interesting case. And, and no, well, I'll just give you that alternative experience. Yes, was well, interesting. Having yeah. learned how to use formal methods, the conclusion in that project was we now understand how to design better. Yeah. And now that we can design better, we don't actually need yeah. them to do it. Well, in a sense, that's, I mean, I think it's like learning Latin. I, I had to do Latin. I, I can't remember a thing about learning Latin and Greek. But on the other hand, it means that I've got yeah. a sort of idea of grammar and things in the back. And, and doing formal methods as a computer scientist thing is very important because then you go into industry, you may not write down the preconditions and postconditions formally, but you've got that sort of mindset in your head so you can think about things in a different way than you would have, with a more rigorous approach. So, which is a very yeah, yes, yeah, yes, yes. yeah. <laughs> so, I think it's, I think all software engineers should have a formal methods grounding, even if they don't, you know, even if a lot of the projects they never use formal methods, or even if they never use formal methods, I think it's good. Even if they never do approve, yeah, yes. Uh, well, I think they should have done a proof. Uh, yeah, at the university, but yes, not. <laughs> right. Um, so, a quick reminder: Can you please sign the attendance sheet if you haven't already done so? I can sign. <laughs> um, uh, for those of you who'd like to go to the bar, the wine bar afterwards, um, it, you simply go along the Strand, turn down Villiers Street on the left. And uh, a little way down there, you'll find a turn into the right under the arches, and it's just the door, it's just there. I hope you can help us yep. with this yes, for a little while. Yes. Um, and there'll be a group of people wandering that direction, so just follow us if you don't know where to go. Um, and a big thank you to Jonathan for coming.